tapped from the new generation thinkers, a party of brilliant young academics who've been lured into the banqueting hall of Broadcasting House by Radio 3 and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. For Nightwaves, we've asked each of them to share an idea inspired by their research. So tonight, Matthew Smith from the University of Strathclyde looks at the cultural history of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, from A to Z. In the spring of 1951, a bizarre coincidence in the history of comic books occurred. Within five days of one another, both the British and the American Dennis the Menace made their first appearance on the public stage. While the dark-haired Dennis graced the pages of the Beano, the fair-haired American quickly became a fixture of newspapers, today appearing in over a thousand different papers in 48 countries. Described as a precocious, enthusiastic, and energetic five-and-a-half-year-old boy, the American Dennis, like his British counterpart, is a habitual troublemaker whose adventures often irritate his long-suffering neighbour, Mr. Wilson, whom Dennis paradoxically regards as his best friend. Much of Dennis's popularity arose from the fact that he was such a recognisable figure. Kids like Dennis were on every street in the burgeoning American suburbs during the 1950s, tearing around corners on their tricycles or hitting baseballs into windows. They were thought to be normal boys doing what boys did. Or were they? Within a decade of Dennis's debut, his exuberant mercurial tendencies were beginning to be seen in a much different light. Instead of being perceived as precocious, enthusiastic, and energetic, boys like Dennis were increasingly described as impulsive, hyperactive, and inattentive, and being referred for medical treatment. Instead of being seen as part of the fabric of American society, like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, boys like Dennis were being diagnosed with what we now call Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, and prescribed powerful stimulant medications, such as Ritalin, to treat their pathological behavior. So what happened in the decade between 1951, when Dennis first peered over Mr. Wilson's fence, and 1961, when Ritalin was first marketed to kids? A clue can be found in the profession of Dennis's father, Mr. Mitchell, an aerospace engineer, since the origins of ADHD are closely linked to the desire to slip the surly bonds of Earth, and specifically, the 4th of October 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first satellite to be put into Earth's orbit. It's likely that as a man of science, Mr. Mitchell viewed the launch of Sputnik with a mix of thrill and apprehension. The image of a beach ball-sized sphere catapulted into space at the flick of a switch was an awe-inspiring sight, heralding a new era of exploration at a time when the highest, deepest, and most remote spots on the planet were being checked off the list of terrestrial places to conquer and to plant flags. But for politically-minded Americans, Sputnik was a glaring indication that the Cold War and the closely linked race for scientific and technological superiority had taken a potentially disastrous turn. If the Soviets were the first to reach space, what did that say about their ability to design new fighter jets, submarines, and most importantly, nuclear weapons? And just how had this development been allowed to occur? For many American politicians, scientists, educators, and military men, the answer was clear. The blame lay squarely with the lackadaisical American education system. Critics ranging from Admiral Hyman Rickover, the father of the nuclear navy, to James Conant, former president of Harvard University, railed against what they saw as a permissive, child-centered, and unchallenging school system, and demanded a return to core subjects, rigorous standards, and higher levels of achievement. Only then would the U.S. develop the scientists and engineers to outpace the Soviets in the race for space. Both high achievers and students who struggled were expected to pull up their socks. Dropping out of school for unskilled work was no longer an option. Thousands of government-funded counsellors were sent into both primary and secondary schools to determine what prevented these children from doing better. They were to be on the lookout for the bright boy or girl whose high ability had been determined by the results of aptitude tests, but whose achievement had been low. This intelligent yet underachieving student would become, alongside Dennis the Menace, the poster child for ADHD. The more counselors analyze what children struggle to reach their potential, the more they determine that certain characteristics, namely hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention, are most likely to interfere with academic success. One team of researchers compared underachievers with so-called future scientists who were attending a space camp and argued that what differentiated such children was an ability to control their impulses and motor activity. 
As early as 1959, parenting columnist Dorothy Barclay observed that a great deal of attention in schools was given to smoking out and stimulating the efforts of the underachievers. In other words, identifying hyperactive children. Barclay's use of the term stimulating was both ironic and prescient. Just two years later, the stimulant Ritalin was permitted for use in children. By the mid-1960s, drugs like Ritalin dominated the treatment of hyperactive children, becoming the fundamental means by which to transform these underachievers into the future scientists who would win the space race and the Cold War. In an era when scientific advancement was sought to take priority over everything, it was appropriate that the solution for the problem of the hyperactive child, the symbol of American academic underachievement, was to be found in the highly scientific, highly technical setting of a pharmaceutical laboratory. Americans may have won the space race by reaching the moon, but the desire to smoke out and to stimulate underachievers did not dissipate. It only grew resulting in successive generations of children whose energetic and enthusiastic behavior, the very stuff that endeared millions to Dennis the Menace, was now medicated away with the writing of a prescription.